Next part of the gauge designation is self temperature compensation. And this number happens to be a 13, which is the correct temperature compensation to match aluminum and quite frankly other materials that expand at about 13 parts per million per degree Fahrenheit. And when we look at techniques for correcting for thermal output, self temperature compensation, that's really us, the manufacturer, designing the gauge to produce a specific output over a given temperature range. And what I mean by that is we're trying to minimize the amount of output you get from the strain gauge due to a temperature change around room temperature. So if you were to look at its response from about 50 to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you would find that the amount of response you got out of a gauge that's well matched is pretty close to zero and just about negligible. Now, not in all cases, but if you're concerned about it, it's a great idea to put a gauge on your part, put it into an environmental chamber, and see what it does. But if you've got a good match, usually around room temperature measurements, say a fluctuation of plus or minus 5 or 10 degrees, most of the time you can just ignore that response. It's small enough. Another method is using a compensating gauge, where now you've got essentially two strain gauges instead of one. You wire them together. Uh, into an adjacent arm of the Wheatstone Bridge and that allows it to subtract the thermal response and you measure just the mechanical. You have to have one active gauge and effectively one compensating gauge and by compensating what we mean is that you take the second gauge, put it on the same material, but that material is not seeing the mechanical load but it is seeing the thermal responses. In a Wheatstone Bridge, if you wire it correctly, we'll take the difference of those two readings so effectively you remove the thermal response and measure just the mechanical. This is a table that shows um, the material type, their corresponding coefficient of thermal expansion, and then the recommended STC value. So you can see for zero there's really two materials which are titanium silicate and Invar that have about a zero coefficient of thermal expansion and we would recommend a zero zero STC for that. Probably the most common STC is steel and cast iron, which basically expands around 6 to 7 parts per million per degree Fahrenheit. We'd recommend a 06 STC for that. Stainless steel copper typically is around a 9, and we'd recommend a 9 STC. And then aluminum and tin and brass are going to be closer to a 13, and we'd recommend a 13 STC for those uh, materials. We also have some other STCs available as well. So in Constantin and Karma, you'll see the, the 00 through a 15 that are offered for both alloys, where uh, with Constantin only, we can also compensate for materials that expand at much higher rates, which would be your unfilled plastics. And we have a 30, a 40, and a 50 STC available uh, in Constantin uh, to match those materials. So if you're testing plastics, you might uh, consider that. Now what really happens? So if we take a material, <clears throat> in this case we take a Bunsen burner and we start to heat it up, we get a, a change in length of that material as it starts to heat up, it expands. And that expansion is going to be a function of the temperature change as well as the alpha, which is the coefficient of thermal expansion of that material. So now if you take a strain gauge and you glue it onto it and you start to heat it up, what you would find is that the alloy, the foil used to make the gauge is going to want to expand, whether it's Constantin or Karma, uh, but also you got the expansion of the material which it's glued onto, and most likely they're not going to expand at the same rate. So when that happens, that starts to drive some response out of the gauge. In addition, you get a temperature coefficient of resistance change out of the gauge as well. So when you take these two outputs and you combine them together, what you end up with is a nonlinear output signal. So temperature coefficient of resistance, difference in the, the expansion of the gauge, if you will, versus the material, that really drives your response. And one of the things you got to remember is that that is not a direct indication of the strain of that material. While the strain of the material is in that signal, it's part of it, that's not the only thing that's going on because you've got the response due to the gauge as well. So some customers will take a gauge and they'll glue it onto a part and they'll start to heat it up and cool it down and think they're looking at just the expansion and contraction in their material. And that is not true. 
it is the expansion and contraction of the material combined with the contribution from the strain gauge. And there are techniques you can use to get rid of that response of the strain gauge, and we'll talk about that at a later time. This curve kind of gives you an idea of what a typical response looks like. Uh, this is a response for a gauge from a specific alloy glued on to 2024 T4 aluminum. And if you look at it, it looks sort of like a lazy S. Where I want you to focus though is look at what's going on around room temperature. We're going to call that 75 degrees Fahrenheit. If you look at this curve, you'll notice from about 50 to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that curve is relatively flat. And what that means is that you have very little output. If you look over on the, the left-hand side, you'll see that we're giving you or providing you thermal output uh, in basically microstrain based on a gauge factor of two. And if you look at the bottom, you got temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. At the top, you got temperature in degrees Celsius. And then over on the right-hand side, you've got the variation of gauge factor with temperature that's shown. So the lazy S curve, if you will, that is your thermal output. Uh, you'll see that around room temperature, if you have it matched, you get very little response. And as you go up in temperature, one of the interesting things that happens is that uh, the output actually goes negative. And that tricks a lot of customers. They're surprised at that. Well, that's the response I was talking about from the sensor that starts kicking in. And then once you get up above about 250, you'll notice it kind of reverses and then starts heading in a positive direction. So thermal output can be kind of tricky. It's one of those topics that uh, we talk about a lot of times with customers to help them work their way through it. In general, you can think of it as a temperature-induced signal from the strain gauge that most of the time you want to subtract it out. And if you want to subtract it out, one of the great things about it is you'll see we've got two equations, one in degrees Fahrenheit, one in degrees Celsius, that you can use to get rid of it. So if you look at these equations, they're a fourth, in some cases, fifth order polynomial that as long as you can monitor the temperature and you can plug this equation into your data acquisition system, you can remove the thermal output out of the measurement. You just got to be able to sense temperature and you got to be able to use this equation on the fly. And all of our data acquisition systems will allow you to do that. Now the second part of this graph is the line and that represents the variation of gauge factor with temperature. And in this particular case, what you'll find is that the strain gauge gets a little bit more sensitive as you go up in temperature. Now, oftentimes this is ignored in real strain gauge measurements and practical strain gauge measurements, but it doesn't have to be because it's a very simple correction. So if you look at it, you'll notice around room temperature, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, effectively the variation is at zero. That's where it gets effectively zeroed out. And then as we go up in temperature, you're getting a positive shift in the gauge factor. In order to correct your readings, all you really have to do is calculate what the gauge factor would be based off of the slope at the temperature at which you're measuring. And then you can correct for it. Even with a very wide temperature swing, you'll notice that we're only really talking about maybe a two to two and a half percent correction. So that's why a lot of times customers might ignore it or, or not take into account for it. But I would encourage you to do so because it's a very easy correction uh, to make. Now, sometimes you'll also find that you may want to rotate the thermal output curve. Let's say, for example, you're testing uh, stainless steel down at very cold temperatures. And if you're testing stainless at cold temperatures, what you'll find is that if you match the gauge to that material, let's say you pick a 09 on a 300 series stainless, what you would find is the slope of the thermal output is very steep when you get down to like liquid nitrogen temperatures. One of the ways to flatten it out, let's say you were testing down there, one of the ways to try to flatten that is to intentionally mismatch the STC to the strain gauge. So we might pick a temperature compensation, let's say 13, that's normally used on aluminum, and we'll glue it on to stainless steel. And what that does, it'll rotate the curve um, in a clockwise fashion. And as we start to rotate it, sorry, in a as the STC is higher than the alpha, it's actually, yes, a clockwise fashion. It rotates it just like this blue curve shows. So what that does, it helps to reduce the slope of the line down at the cryogenic temperatures. 
that a good thing? In some cases, yes, if that's where you're primarily testing. And if you do the opposite, if you pick an STC that's less than the alpha, then it does just the opposite curve rotation to the standard thermal output curve. So now it rotates counterclockwise. Not a lot of customers do this, but some do. And this is a technique you can use when you're testing at temperature extremes to uh, help flatten the thermal output curve at those extremes. So this slide shows the sensitivity change with temperature. Uh, this is the correction for that gauge factor variation with temperature we just looked at. So you've got two equations. Uh, we're trying to calculate the actual strain. That's what we're chasing after. So if you see epsilon sub A, that means the actual strain. Epsilon sub I is the indicated strain, as you may read off an instrument. Uh, F is the uh, gauge factor. F sub I is the indicated gauge factor where F sub A is the actual gauge factor that has been corrected. So you sort of use the FA equation first, calculate what that actual gauge factor is based off the gauge factor you read from the package as well as that percent change that you would read uh, from the engineering data as well. Calculate the actual gauge factor and then plug that in. It's just a simple ratio metric correction. Uh, what was the indicated? at the time you took the measurement, divided by the actual, multiply that times the indicated strain, and now you've got the actual strain. So it's actually a very simple correction to make, and I would encourage you to do that uh, if you've got some wider temperature swings in your measurements. If you're primarily testing around room temperature, I'm not sure that it's ne necessary, but if you're going to cryogenic, maybe liquid nitrogen, or maybe you're going up above maybe two or 300 degrees Fahrenheit, then absolutely I'd, I'd highly recommend that you correct uh, the gauge factor. Um, the next slide shows um, a typical gauge factor uh, change as a function of temperature. Uh, if you look at the graph that's to the left, that's gauge factor variation um, as a function of temperature, and it's got karma you'll notice that karma does something a little bit different than constantan. Constantan gets a little more sensitive as it goes up in temperature where karma gets less sensitive. So you'll see the line sloping from left to right and what that means is that as you go up in temperature it gets a little bit less sensitive. And then if we look at the graph over on the right hand side you'll see a, a graph for A foil which is constantan and D foil which is isoelastic. A foil as I mentioned slopes upward so it gets more sensitive and D alloys does something kind of unusual and that it's not a linear function at all. So really with D alloy you're probably best to use it around room temperature type conditions or you really want to make sure that you correct the data in particular if you start testing at high temperatures because you can see that you could easily have a three to four percent error uh, in your measurement and you definitely want to take that into account. 